Hey, what is up, everybody? Michael Crump back here again, talking about the latest and the greatest in PlayStation homebrew news and much, much more. You may be wondering, Michael, why do you have Oakage Shadow King on the PlayStation Store in your browser right now? And well, the answer to that is, is that today, this game is probably going to sell a whole ton of copies. And the reason for that is, is that Seaturt released a blog post detailing that he was able to get this game, which is a PlayStation 2 game that runs on PlayStation 4 as well as PlayStation 5, running other PlayStation 2 ISOs with the exploit that he was just able to disclose. Now, before we jump into this, I do want to say that the method is not available today to use. So if you do buy this game today, just keep in mind that you won't be able to load other PlayStation 2 ISOs on it, at least not right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at the video first that Seaturt released. Okay, so just to begin with here, he is on a PlayStation 4 and he is about to run Oakage, which again is a PlayStation 2 game. Now, keep in mind here that he was not signed into the PlayStation Network when at least he recorded this video. But again, this is on a PlayStation 4, and this should work with PlayStation 4 latest firmware as well as a PlayStation 5 on the latest firmware with a PSN copy, at least of Oakage Shadow King. So let's go ahead and play it now. Now, basically, the game is just being loaded up. There we can see we got the PlayStation 2 logo here. Okay, and so at this point, it says waiting to receive a disk image file. Is, is that he is running on Windows, and you can see that he's running NC, which is netcat-w3, and then an IP address, and then a port number, and then he is redirecting a, another game, which is Clona2, with a .iso. So he already has this PlayStation 2 game as an ISO image on his computer, and basically he is sending that ISO image over to his PlayStation 4's IP address on port 9023. We should see the start screen in just a moment. Once it completes uploading, we'll fast forward. And there we can see remounting and now booting. And so now here is the other game that is currently being loaded up. And so there you go. And that is pretty much it for the video. So he did put together a GitHub page which details this. So let's take a look at what that post says now. In this article, I will discuss how I successfully escaped the PS2 emulator for the PlayStation 4. Also see part two, which is currently not released, which covers the next part of the exploit chain and PlayStation's response to the research. This was discovered back in September 2021, but Sony has to review it. And then once they review it, then he can actually disclose it to the public, which is what he got permission to do. So he says right here in the intro that it's been a while since he worked on any PlayStation hacking, but with the release of the PS5 and the PS5's bug bounty program, I was motivated to attempt some kind of exploit chain to work on the PlayStation 5. I settled on attacking the PS2 emulator because escaping it would grant the ability to run pirated PS2 games on the PS4 and the PS5, and potentially also the PSN cloud gaming service. It says this is particularly valuable because access of running just a subset of the available PS2 games on these platforms is being charged at the highest tier. And looking at the membership plan here, there is premium, which will cost you right around 120 US dollars for a 12 month subscription versus what we were kind of used to paying with the essential, which was a 12 month costing you right at $60. And so that is quite a substantial jump of, you know, really 60 bucks in order to get access 
to some of those PS2 games that have obviously been out for quite a while. So again, that was at least something that he noted right here as point number one. Point number two was about the PS2 emulator is some of the last remaining JIT or just in time privileged code on the PS5. So having JIT privilege means that fully compromising the emulator, including the compiler code process, would grant the ability to run fully arbitrary native code on the PS4 and the 5 without the need for a kernel exploit. This would be especially convenient on the PS5 because of a newly introduced hypervisor, which is one of the biggest blocks that we have right now in the PS5 homebrew scene, which enforces the code pages, both user land and kernel, are not readable. It says, with arbitrary code execution in a PS4 game process, homebrew software, including JIT optimized emulators, and potentially even some pirated commercial PS4 games, could be run under this context. And then the next point here was that under the PlayStation security model, it's essentially unpatchable. It says, since PlayStation can't be held responsible for the security of third-party games, their security model operates under the assumptions that games are compromised and focuses on instead securing higher privileged layers on the platform. So in short, there is nothing that's checking if there's any sort of update that's available. So once we have this, more than likely Sony can't fix it. It's probably not worth the time, the effort, the energy, and the money in order to try to prevent people from running this exploit. Inside of this, he does describe the PS2 emulator anatomy, which I'm not gonna cover here. Here is where he found the PS2 code execution entry point. Our exploit chain will begin by exploiting a PS2 game to achieve code execution within the emulator, either through a save game or through a purely controller triggered exploit. For his chain, he settled on Oakage Shadow King, which has a typical stack buffer overflow if you extend the player town or name. So basically, this is based off of a save game exploit. Now, into this code here, you'll see here is the emulator bug and he details what the bug was and how that he was able to exploit it. I'm going to scroll down through all of this part that now that we've escaped the PS2 emulator, the natural first thing to do would be boot another game. So there was a couple of options here, bundling it within the save file. You could probably also copy games off USB storage by manually porting over a USB and a FAT implementation. But I chose to upload the desired game to the console over the local network on each run. His proof of concept without any compression took right around 20 minutes for a 1.3 megabyte game. It says once the ISO is somewhere accessible on the file system, it was just a point of locating the emulator's code responsible for opening the disk file by setting a breakpoint and then using the exploit to call it with a traversed path, undoing any leftover corruption and finally having the PS2 code call load EXEC PS2 to boot an elf on the newly mounted virtual disk in order to start the new game. And so here's my take on this. So with the PlayStation 4, users that are on 9.00 or lower, well, obviously, this isn't going to do anything for us. We already have the ability to run PlayStation 2, ISO images to PlayStation 4, uh, games or package files, we can also run any sort of homebrew that we want. Where this is obviously a bit more interesting is, is that if you are a PlayStation 4 user that is running the very latest firmware or a PlayStation 5 user that's also running the very latest firmware. Now, this would give you the ability to play some PlayStation 2 ISO games, and I know it was mentioned in the article that this could lead to other retail-based games, 
But I think for the most part, looking at what you would need to do in order to get that game to run, you know, for example, he was using Wi-Fi. And even though it took him 20 minutes, obviously that, you know, you could compress that image and there's a bunches of ways that you could, you know, reduce that. It would still require some sort of ability to, you know, set up. It would require running that netcat command each time that you wanted to load an ISO. Now, I know that there was a couple of other methods that was in there, but at least for right now, on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 latest firmware, what this would really get you would be the ability to run PlayStation 2 ISO images. I don't think that that's necessarily worth it for most people, especially if you had to do you know, these things such as run this netcat command. But I'll pass the question off to you. You know, what do you think about this exploit? Do you think that this is something that's going to lead to bigger and greater things? It's just going to lead to the PlayStation 5 being able to run actual homebrew applications or maybe even run retail PlayStation 5 games. Let me know in the comments below. All right, so thank you so very much for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Michael, out!